Hi, I'm John Lombard, standing in for Nalini Haynes in this Dark Magazine interview with Justin Cronin. Justin Cronin graduated from Harvard and the Iowa Writers Workshop. He has won the Hemingway Foundation Pen Award, the Stephen Crane Prize, and a Whiting Award. He has taught creative writing and has the author in residence at LaSalle University in Philadelphia for 11 years. He's a former professor of English at Rice University and currently lives with his wife and children in Houston, Texas. Justin has written five novels, Mary and O'Neill and The Summer Guest, as well as The Passage, a vampire trilogy spanning a thousand years. Welcome, Justin. Thank you. Please tell us about The Passage trilogy. Well, the, the, the first thing I'll say about The Passage trilogy is that it is a, um, it is a trilogy. It is enormously long um, and therefore somewhat difficult to describe in its entirety. But what I will say is the, uh, I'll sort of tell you the, the, the original the idea of it, which is that um, a scientist, for personal reasons, um, comes to think that the legend of the vampire is rooted probably in some kind of biological pathogen that, has, that creates the symptoms, biologically plausible symptoms, that have become, over the centuries, the origin of the vampire legend. And he goes looking for this pathogen. Um, and he finds it in a species of bat in South America. Um, brings it back to the United States, and with the hope that this uh, viral agent can be used um, essentially to cure every disease, because the centerpiece of the vampire legend is that it is a mortal being. And um, un unfortunately, that's not how it works out. The military gets involved, they want to use this virus to create a weapon. Um, Twelve death row inmates are infected with the virus. Um, they become um, essentially immortal monsters who feed on mm -hmm. blood, they escape, um, and the destruction of the North American continent ensues. Um, you know, that's right, because your vampires do start out like a cross between zombies and vampires yeah. after, after the viral outbreak. Now, was this a conscious decision to lean more towards speculative fiction rather than fantasy? Well, what I wanted to do is I wanted to use the story, first of all, I wanted to use it just to tell a very human story. I mean, the characters of, uh, in the novel. Most of the novel takes place a hundred years after the event um, when the, in North America is essentially depopulated. It's mostly a story of survivors who've lived for generations in a walled compound. So it's really a story of you know, humanity surviving. Um, but what I wanted to do was, when you work with any established trope, any established tradition, you know, like the vampire tradition, you have to bring something new to the party. And I'm not somebody who's a big fan of magic and fiction. It's not my thing. What I wanted to do is take a legend that includes magic and then reboot it as scientific phenomena. I mean, I feel like we've got science is, is the is the magic of our time. So, um, so it wasn't it was it was a decision to kind of take take a legend and then ground it in some kind of um, human and also biological reality. I think it's interesting. But these are the next questions. I think a few people have wondered about Amy. Mm -hmm. The girl from nowhere. Right. Now she's telepathic with both animals and humans, but that's before the mad scientists get their hands on her. That is the question that people have. Yeah, I um, I, I explain this in the third book. Um, there is it was it's one of the lingering mysteries of the story, and so I can't really give you an answer without essentially spoiling one of the you know one of the revelations of the third book. It's actually not all that complicated, but she does have. Um, you know, special qualities. I don't think of those qualities as um, magical. I think of them as actually in some ways quite common and um, typical of young children. So, In the opening chapters of the passage you develop several characters from different walks of life. Mm -hmm. Now this felt a lot like a conscious homage to World War Z, the book. Did World War Z have any influence on you? To who? Uh, World War Z. Oh, World War Z, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, World War Z had no influence whatsoever, I had not read it. Um, and I confess I still have not read it, although I saw the movie. Um, people, are often, people often ask me about the, the, the other horror writers who might have influenced me, and it's, it's a question I struggle with because I'm not typically a reader of horror. And I've seen uh, movies in the genre, but I'm not really a reader of it. And um, yeah, I love The Walking Dead. Um, I like Mad as Living Dead, I mean, I'm, I'm, just like everybody in the world right now is in these sort of, you know, caught up in zombie narrative. But when I started the book in 2005, um, first of all, that was before the little vampire boomlet, right? The, and we all know the books we're talking about. Um, they, they had 
I think maybe the first of the, those books had come out, and they're of course very different from what I do, and they're they're YA literature for young women, so I, they never came across my radar. Um, World War Z is, is um, not a book I've, I've actually read, I confess, um, and I'm not I'm, I don't view myself principally as 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 a, as a horror writer. It's not a genre that that I feel um, well well versed in. But like everybody, I know about. I know the stories, you know, I know the vampire. And on Halloween, at some point I opened the front door of my house and there's like a four foot tall vampire standing there <laughs> asking for candy. And it's a ubiquitous story. We all have our um, experiences of it. Um, and, and the zombie thing hadn't come along at all at that time, actually. I mean, the, the, the explosion of zombie uh, narrative that came after walk, Walking Dead, I think, was really the, the instigator to that. So all that stuff wasn't on my radar. When people say, who's your favorite horror writer? I always say Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> so as you might know, Booklist, um, when they read your, the first novel in the Passage Trilogy, they thought it was so similar to Stephen King in The Stand. Mm -hmm. They had to check to make sure that Stephen King hadn't actually written the book under a pseudonym. Because right. that was their first thought. So King actually also blurred your book, right. re recommending it to your fans. Right. So what was that like for you? Well, I mean, Stephen King is, is, you know, he's a remarkable guy. I mean, he's, he's not really a writer. He's kind of a monument at this point because of the wide variety of genres he works in, the different kinds of books that he does. He's very good at the short story. He writes the novella wonderfully, which is a form that is, you know, it's 19th century German form for the most part. Um, and, of course, he writes in all, all kinds of different novels in different registers. Um, of course, I've read this stand. I confess I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes um, somewhat nonplussed by the book's comparison to the stand. What they seem to have in common to me is simply that a lot of people suffer and die in North America. Beyond that, I don't see a very strong overlap in terms of plot. And there are, there are many pandemic narratives out there. I mean, there, there, there was one that I, that I was... Um, that was sort of formative for me as a young man, a book called Earth Abides by a writer named George Stewart. It was written in 1948. And if I had to give a book that was an influence on at least that aspect of the passage, that's the one that, that I would choose. Um, but of course, also getting Stephen King's blessing on these books is, is you know, it's phenomenal. And um, I, I've never met him. And I owe him a, a great debt of gratitude. I, I should stop by his house and do a few loads of laundry and leave. Oh, I think it might be the um, reading the stand because you draw, you have people from different sort of walks of life. Right. It's natural they come together. Mm -hmm. that as, as, as they do in, in Earth Abides. I mean, it seems to me exactly. a logical, right. it's a logical consequence yeah. of an event that mm -hmm. kills a lot of people, but not quite everybody. Is yeah. that the natural human urge to find the other survivors, to mm -hmm. organize your life in some way um, with, with, with companionship. Um, is natural. I mean, that's the mm. that, that, that's the basis of The Walking Dead, for instance. I mean, it's it's, it's, yeah. it's just woven into that kind of story, because any story about the end of the world really is not a story about the end of the world. It's what happens afterward, and uh, you know how the people who survived this event, um, you know, manage manage to yeah. go on, and, and and what happens to them as a as a consequence. Um, so. Uh, you know, the similarities to The Stand, notwithstanding, I'd, I'd say that, it's, it's, mm. that similarity is just endemic to the kind yeah. of story that it is. Mm. Um, that actually leads really nicely to the next question, and that's that the passage reads like social commentary in many places, mm -hmm. and there's references to the Manhattan Project, and the communities showcase all those really great social dynamics you were talking right. about. I think I remember like the, one of the vampires is quite snobbish in his tastes. Sure. Not, yeah. not everyone necessarily appreciates the good culture that he thinks that they should. Mm -hmm. um, so there's um, there's everything from caring each other to lynch mobs. Is that one of the things you're really interested in showing? Having like the walled community. And sure. I mean, one of the things I wanted to do is if you know if you jump the story hundred years later and you've got survivors, you have to sit mm -hmm. down and think very carefully about what are the natural kinds of communities that would arise. In other words, who would survive and what forms of social organization would they employ that would enable their survival. So the community that the story starts with, the first one, first colony based, you know, located in the mountains of Southern California, um, actually it's based on a town where I, I spent a, a summer many, many years ago teaching a little arts academy. Um, that's a community that's settled by children, essentially, who were evacuees 
Um, and uh, they're, they're placed in this wall compound, and then the army never comes back. I mean, there are other people who are supposed to come, but they never do. And so they're not left entirely to their own devices. They, um, they have a certain number of minders, adults who work for FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency in the United States. Um, they form a social organization based on familial relationships. It seems to make sense to them. It's what they know. It's what they have. It's who's related to whom. And so their form of government as they grow older and are replaced by other generations is um, it's called the household, right? And so their principal avenue of survival, apart from the walls and the lights that defend them, is the fact that they are bonded through family relationships. So that it's essentially a kibbutz. I mean, that's, yeah. that's kind of what it is. Um, and, they, and it has a, a socialist economy, for instance, something called equal share. Everybody gets an equal share of what they of the resources that they have. Um, the, the other community, and the one featured in the second book, is a police state. Mm -hmm. It's a police state. Um, you can see how uh, authoritarian rule would be another form with, with, with an enslaved labor force would be another another form of government that would uh, arise naturally and indeed have some durability um, and the last one is the is uh, Texas Kerbal Texas the Republic of Texas which is uh, in some ways also a, an homage to the you know I don't say my home state I'm not originally from Texas but I've lived there for a very long time and I've raised my children there um, they live under something called the, the Code of Modified Martial Law with a sort of power sharing between the civilian and military authorities and they have more abundant resources than the other communities and they also have a more distinct relationship to the past, right? The first colony, for instance, nobody even remembers the old world, but there's mm -hmm. a kind of continuum of time that exists in, um, in Kerrville. So these seem to me to be forms of human organization that would naturally arise as a consequence of these events. If, in other words, if, if people are going to survive, who are they and how are they going to do it? And these seem to me to be kind of three formulas for that. Yeah, yeah, they don't go it alone. Just, no, yeah. no, I mean, they, all, all the people who tried to go alone have died a long time yeah. ago, right? I mean, one of the theses of the trilogy and in, in its area of principal interest is, um, is that what survives are, um, for the most part, are fairly no noble instincts and uh, the connections between people, especially when they're good, strong, firm, loving connections. Those are the qualities that enable survival in the face of, of disaster. That's something I found very interesting because when I was doing my research for this, um, you sometimes find in post-apocalyptic worlds everything is so stuffed that you just wonder why anyone actually bothers. Like um, Snowpiercer, where humanity is just on a train that's circling the globe in right. this endless winter. Um, I did wonder that because things actually um, seem so bleak in your series by right. the end, and the human race has sort of you know almost been harvested to the point of extinction. That's right. like, why go on in that sort of circumstance? Right, and that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, why go on? Like, what's yeah. what's the reason to go yeah. on? And all the characters are questioning that. Um, and the answer is, is the reason to go on is the person who's sitting next to you. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's it, they they live a kind of a, a sort of foxhole environment. They say soldiers, you know, in in, in wartime, they don't um, die for their country. They die for the guy who's yeah. standing next to them. And um, and that kind of heroism is the greatest of all, and the one that has the does the most social good, and it's the one that binds my characters together. The Passage Trilogy focuses on a group of people who are deeply connected to one another. I mean, they, they form a family, um, and it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a group of friendships, and some of them become lovers and so on as they, as they grow older, and they become bonded to other institutions. But essentially, it's a story of a family whose, con whose the, mem the commitment of the members to each other ends up being the force that, in the end, saves humanity and I'm not I'm not that's not a spoiler because anybody who reads the books knows fairly early on yeah. that humanity indeed has survived so it's a it's a story tells you how that occurred yeah um okay now Wikipedia so you know that's Wikipedia yes there's a per, there's the authority there's yeah. the authority yeah. it says that you just started no, we might re-edit that question yeah. uh, says you started writing the passage because your daughter wanted a girl to save the world is that true yeah yeah it's oh, true wow. I mean well I didn't write it because of that um, yeah. Specifically, I started the book um, as a game play that I played with my daughter who had come to me and she was eight years old at the time, right, it's a, a little kid. She's not a little kid anymore, she's 20. Um, but she came to me and expressed the concern that my other books um, 
based upon her readings of the flaps and her view of the covers, mm -hmm. so it wasn't complete information. Um, she was concerned they might be dull. And, of course, I, I don't think they're dull, and they're not for eight-year-olds, but nevertheless, uh, I said, fine, okay, let's, let's invent a story together. And so we spent an hour together um, each day after school in the fall of 2005. Um, I would go running, and she would come on her bicycle, and we would just play a game and spin out a story. And that's, that became the outline for the first book, which is absolutely not for kids, right? It's, this is not, a, this is not a, a book for children. Um, as I always say, a hooker shoots a John on page five. So and very quickly when I sat down to write it, it became you know, what it is, which is a sprawling grown-up yeah. epic story with some very scary grown-up stuff in it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how it came to be. I had no intention of writing it when we were playing this game. It was really just a game. We were passing some time together, um, having some fun. I wanted her to improve her bicycle riding skills, which were terrible. Um, and so, the, honestly, the whole, the, the outline for the first book was constructed entirely with me running and a kid on a bicycle spinning mm. this stuff out. As I said, I wasn't going to write it. I had another book I was working on. But then when we were done, I realized that I had an enormous amount of information. I'd taken no notes at all. So I went to my office and I said, okay, I'm going to at least type this stuff up. Maybe I'll use it sometime. Um, and, and I realized that we had an enormous volume of information. I mean, literally like every move the book would make in some form, plus sort of quick summaries of books two and three. Mm -hmm. And so I decided I would give it a whirl. I mean, again, I still wasn't seriously you know, doing it, but then I started writing it. And I don't want to say it started writing itself, but it clearly was the book that wanted to be written at that point in my life for a variety of reasons. And I never looked back. All right, cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so what was it? We've talked a lot about your influences. What mm -hmm. sort of other factors um, came into developing the trilogy, mm -hmm. and particularly how it may have changed from that original outline? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it changed only in its um, logical particulars, really. Mm. Um, the, 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 the plot that my daughter and I devised um, w was pretty much adhered to. I mean, I had to make changes for uh, you know, reasons of narrative logic and to make things make sense, and I'd come up with some cockamamie idea we had to get our characters from plot point A to point B, and I would realize that wouldn't work. I had to come up with other means to do so. But for the most part, I adhered to the outline, at least in spirit, through the whole first book. I do that for everything I write. I mean, I have what I call a battle plan for the book. And I, I've long believed that when you're writing, you need to have complete knowledge of the story even before you start um, for the book to have a feeling of, of authority. You know, so when, when a reader starts, you know, they open the book and they turn to page one, right away the novel should be telling them that it knows where it's going. Um, so it, again, I adhered to it um, for the most part. And I, do, I did the same thing for books two and books three, and book three, but um, mm -hmm. that said, my model for all this is, is, is sort of like playing jazz. I'm a terrible musician, but I, I like to play the piano. Um, and you sit down and play Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered. I just tried to, I just tried to hotwire the mm -hmm. piano in the lobby of the hotel, mm -hmm. actually, it was a lot. Um, and you play it, and you know the three chords, it's a, it's yeah. a two, five, one, and there's a melody, um, and then you start messing around with it. But the, you know, the person who's listening to it and you're playing it, you're always hearing that the, the melody in the background. I mean, it's buried. Sometimes you move way off of it, but everybody knows it's still there. They can feel the presence of it. So there's, and then and then it's it's guaranteed how the song will end because yeah. it, it, it it can only end one way because of the way the the song is structured. And so when I have a plan for a novel, I'm basically playing jazz. The melody is there. I've got it all written down. I know what I'm going to be doing with the story. But in the meantime. You know, there's a lot of room to move, and that's that's my process. It's not the right process for every writer by a long shot. I'm sure other people have their other, their ways of doing things, but I, it's the way I have to do it. Okay. Your trilogy has been this is probably something you get asked a lot as well. It mm -hmm. has been option for development into movies mm -hmm. and websites have cited Ridley Scott and Fox Two Thousand. Yeah. Um, has been a little while since it's been cited. Do you have any update oh, yeah. on progress or? Well, and also, what have you learned from the experience? Um, well, the the, the 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 trilogy was bought for the movies. It wasn't an option. It was bought um, right at the start. I mean, it was it was in the same it, in the same period of time in which 
Uh, it was purchased um, by publishers both in the United States and then in Great Britain and Germany and all the places that it's, that it's, um, that it's published. Uh, the movies got involved right away. Um, I always had, you know, concerns that something this sprawling uh, would be very difficult to accommodate in the format of feature film. Um, and, uh, and that has proven to be correct. Uh, so, at this point, what has happened is we've shifted it from the film side to television. Mm -hmm. And which I think is, you know, I think it's a natural fit for the kind of story that it is. It's episodic, it has multiple tracks, multiple mm -hmm. timelines. Uh, a large ensemble cast, many main characters, um, and television right now is, is terrific. Um, just as I think a lot of tentpole movies have become just kind of large CGI um, extravaganzas, um, a lot of good good storytelling has moved from there into into television. So um, we have a an arrangement at this point for TV. Um, you know, the ink's not completely dry, and I don't know what will come of it. I'm reasonably optimistic about it. Um, my involvement with it w w will be um, something, but I, I can't say exactly. I'm not somebody who has personal ambitions to work in film and television. Um, I, I view myself as a novelist, and that's what I'm good at, and that's what apparently I was made to do. So. Um, if it happens, great, and I'd be very interested in the process and uh, some level of involvement, and I think they want me to be involved, but um, that's, that's where things stand right now, and I think it's a good fit, so I hope it comes to fruition. Okay, we're very, we've only got a couple of questions left, and there's sure. a few general ones, but you can talk about whatever you pretty much want to, which yeah. is always fun. Okay. Um, so what sort of authors, you've talked a bit about your own influences, mm -hmm. you're not really a horror reader, mm -hmm. um, but what sort of authors and stories do you enjoy? That's a good question because my reading is in some ways counterintuitive. Um, I um, I began as a literary writer, um, although I didn't begin as a literary reader because nobody does. You know, I, I I grew up on a very heavy diet of science fiction, and um, and genre fiction of, of many different kinds. My 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 books all came from the used paperback book sale at my school. Um, and so we're, you know, we're talking about the early and mid-70s. So, um, nice face mm -hmm. there. Um, and so I would go and I would, I would you know, for five bucks mm -hmm. you get a grocery sack worth of books, and mm -hmm. it would be the, the big bestsellers of the day, right? Mm -hmm. It would be Jaws, and Day of the Jackal, yeah, yeah. and Roots, and uh, all that stuff, right? And so I, I would read them indiscriminately, you know? It looked interesting, mm -hmm. and I'd read it, and if it continued to be interesting, I'd read the whole book. Um, eventually, I became, you know, a college English major. I specialized in 20th century British literature. Um, mm -hmm. I became um, a college professor, a college English professor. So I have all those tastes. I began as a literary writer. My first two books are substantially quieter than the Passage trilogy. Um, to this day, my reading habits are inclined somewhat towards the literary. But uh, what I'll also say is that when I'm writing, which is mm, all the time for the most part, um, I do steer, steer, steer clear of any material that feels like it in some ways has a kind of overlap, right? So, writing the past trilogy, I didn't read any end of the world novels, right? I stayed away yeah. from that kind of material. Um, and what I would read for was, for the most part, a kind of literary refreshment. Um, I would go and read a writer who wrote really great sentences, you know, because mm -hmm. when you're... Um, you know, going to your office every day for six hours, what you're doing when you get up there is you're making a whole bunch of sentences, right? And there comes a time when you wake up and you say to yourself, I have no more sentences left. I've used all of my sentences. And so you gotta go, go find, you gotta go find a writer who will remind you of the infinite richness and variety of language so that you can get your characters from here to there and, and you know, and then have the more human moments and you feel like you have more language, once again, at your disposal. So a lot of the books I read are more literary. I often cite um, Ian McEwan as a writer that I really love, who I, I, I relied on him a lot when I was writing a passage, uh, the third book. It was just that he was the writer that I went to for a refreshment. It often involves rereading, you know? Um, you yeah. get through somebody's whole list and you say, every time I read this book, I feel more like writing, so I'm good. I'll just keep, keep doing that. Um, on the other on the other side, though, um, right now I'm reading uh, 
the Expanse series of science fiction novels. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you're familiar with those, but they become a terrific television show in the United States on the Sci-Fi Network. And I, I, I came across it because of the TV show. I, not through my, my life as a writer or, or somebody working in the entertainment industry, I came across the, the show because I know, I met the guy who's the, the creator of the show. I met him at a friend's birthday party. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I watched the show and I really liked it. And I watched it with my son, who's 13 years old. And um, we had been engaged in a project uh, over the course of the last year of, of um, my taking him to the sci-fi that I grew up on, right? Because I, I, you know, I just finally had sat through enough superhero movie, movies at the multiplex, and I said, oh, "Great, I'll still go to these movies with you, but I want to, I want you to also to see the stuff that I grew up on, which didn't have all the special effects, um, which." You know, won't dazzle you with spectacle, um, whether they're books or, or movies or television shows, but where, you know, in my opinion, it's really rooted in the character. So we did, for instance, we watched the original Star Trek, mm -hmm. right? One episode per night, in order, all three seasons, right? And he loved it. It was fantastic. It was fantastic. So I introduced him to the Heinlein novels that I read as a kid, um, and uh, we watched. Um, the Aliens movies, right, which he, again, loved, and, you know, you look at them now, the special effects are, are you know, they're meager by comparison to what we watch now, but they're doled out in such a uh, such a meticulous manner, and the stories are so good that it doesn't matter that, you know, really, the alien whore is actually six French gymnasts in, in rubber suits, which, which it is, right? Um, so anyway, we came across The Expanse, and we watched the show together, and we really liked it. And because I was going on extended book tours, this starting in the spring, and then he would be going to camp, summer camp, for one of the months when I was uh, actually available, I was going to see my son, my 13-year-old boy, who I adore. I was going to see him one month out of five, mm. right? which is rough. Neither one of us is really happy about that. I said, okay, here's something we can do. Let's continue the dad son sci fi club. We'll read all the Expanse novels and then we can, you know, kind of keep in yeah. touch and talk about them. So he's actually a little ahead, a little ahead of me. He's reading the, the fourth one now and I'm on the third, but they're a lot of fun. I really like them. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of touching to me. I mean, I really like doing this with, with my kid because, you know, you, you try to pass things down to your children in some way. And this is a, you know, one of the best parts of my boyhood was the, the science fiction novels and movies and television shows uh, such as they were that, that I had at that time. That's cool, because that does lead us to, you've just you've yeah. been on an extensive tour, which yeah. should be, is finishing soon, I believe. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to Germany in November. Okay, so um, not and, quite done yet. And, and I've got a lot of the foreign translations come out actually in the spring, so I, I don't know if I'll be uh, traveling uh, to you know France or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I, I've done touring in many different countries. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Um, this book's a departure from obviously your, your first two. Yes. This trilogy has been an, a, a massive investment, but a big departure. Mm -hmm. What do you think might be next for you? Are you return to sort of literary fiction? No, I'm, I'm, what I, here's the thing. I mean, people say like, I wrote literary fiction and then I worked it. I, yeah. I did sort of genre. I mean, the, one of the things I'll say about genre is that everything's a genre. Right? Um, it, every literary novel is it falls into some subcategory um, in which it is in. In, engaged with and connected to other similar books. I mean, the, the example I always give for this is my favorite current genre, which is male midlife crisis novels. Right? I mean, I'm a, I'm a gentleman of a certain age, you know. So, uh, if there's a good male midlife crisis novel out there. I am the first in line at the bookstore for it. Um, but these forms, whether it's you know uh, an apocalyptic novel or a western, I, I mean, the passage in some ways is more of a western than anything else. Um, Whatever that, these are just ways of telling a story about people. So, um, what I do intend to do though is to continue with the idea of a central concept that is um, one that I liked as a kid because I think that's naturally attractive. I, I really like doing that. I mean, the passage was a conversation with all the end of the world books I read as a kid. I was a Cold War kid. Those books were very important to me and I wanted to write my own. There were other stories, types of stories that I loved as a kid too. So, the next project is going to be, once again, I think a return to one of those stories. I can't tell you which right now because they're not even my age enough. Um, but again, using it as a way of just, you know, telling a story about people because yeah. I think that's what, 
that's what that's at the, at the end of the day what concerns me you know as an artist and as a person and then what I think really connects people to stories it is the characters at the end of the day if a book's got to have any kind of durability and really connect to people so that when they look up having finished the book they're kind of they're drawn more deeply into life you know that's that's how you do it so I'm always gonna write that way but I do like a strong exciting plot I, I like those kinds of engines where ordinary life is not ordinary anymore. Yeah. You know. I'll ask a follow up on that. Yes. Yeah. Um, is that it's interesting because when you started writing the book, it was before the vampire boom. Right. It was before the massive zombie boom. Correct. Has it been interesting because you were dealing with a uh, mythos that you know you were dealing with all this sort of ancient lore right. and ideas of vampires? Um, has it been interesting for you had to sort of change your game plan at all, responding to the popularity of these works? Or? Um, that's a, that is an interesting question, and the answer to that is no. I didn't change my game plan because I've never had a game plan that is in any way connected to the idea of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, when I sit down to write a book, my goal and my method um, is to just write the best book I can. And I'm not a tactical thinker. I don't really think about the marketplace at all. The day that my agent, or the night before my agent, sent out the manuscript of the passage, and it was a partial manuscript. We sold it when it happened. I'd written about a third of the book um, with, you know, a, an outline and then summaries of book two and three. Um, my wife asked me, what will you do if nobody publishes it? And, um, you know, the question which she was really asking was, will you finish it? The answer to that was yes. Um, but I, I, I mentioned this just as a way of illustrating the fact that I had no idea if anybody would want it at all, right? Um, it was different from what I'd done in the past. Um, I had no real models for it, except for things that I read as a kid. And I was known for a certain kind of book, and publishing, generally speaking, wants you to write the same kind of book. They don't really, they don't like it when you jump the tracks. Um, and I honestly didn't know if anybody would buy it at all. I mean, I was doing the whole, I, I engaged in the whole thing because I liked it, because I liked it. It was, I was, it had tapped into something in me as a you know as a person and as a and as a writer that felt honest and true and engaging to me. So um, subsequently, there was a lot of vampire narrative, um, television shows, movies, books, and then sometime a little bit after that, um, a bit of resurgent in the zombie thing. Um, I, it, it, I don't want to say it happened off my radar because I really love The Walking Dead. You know, I love The Walking Dead, um, and uh, so I was I was aware that it was it was going on, but it didn't. It, I didn't. I, I didn't try to position myself anywhere within that as a context because it was meaningless to me as a context. I mean, my context was me alone in the room, writing the books. The other thing I would say is that when people say like all of a sudden we love zombies and we love vampires, that's true, but. These stories have never gone away, you know? I mean, I grew up on a steady diet of vampires and zombies and all that stuff. It, it's, it, there, there may be periods of slight recession in these things, but for the most part, the monster economy is always pretty robust. And, um, and we come back to the same forms again and again. We basically have four monsters, werewolves, vampires, and zombies, and Frankensteins, and we come back to them again and again and again because they're powerful stories to us. They tap into, you know, they tap into very fundamental human questions. So I, you know, people say there was a boom. Okay, there's a boom, but I feel like there's always been a boom. You know, mm -hmm. these, these, these stories have never gone out of favor. All right, cool. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time to talk to Dark Matter. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.